Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I love uh, that so many of you have joined for what is, for me, an extremely, extremely passionate subject. Uh, I want to keep this very, very interactive. Please ask lots of on-topic questions. The Q&A button is there. There is no wrong question. There is no dumb question. If you want me to re-explain something, tell me. I will keep re-explaining it until you understand. And so uh, our headline today, of course, is liberal arts. Now, uh, I want to a little bit go into what this actually means because one of the biggest problems that we face when we talk about the term liberal arts across the world, it means different things to very different people. Now, traditionally, the word liberal arts is, is associated, at least in the Western civilization, with a, a traditional uh, form of all-rounded education that very special uh, select people would get. Now, you have to understand, by this, I mean going back uh, to hundreds, if not thousands of years, everybody was not able to attend a school or a college back then. And, they, and different countries and states, in fact, restricted who could read and write and who could be educated. And so at those times, they had come out with a curriculum, which was usually meant either for, uh, if you go back to all the way to the Greeks and the Romans, for, for citizens who were allowed to vote. And there was a very small number of people who were allowed to vote when they were uh, in a democratic phase. Uh, royal families, very rich, political, well-connected people. And the entire point uh, of, of a general liberal arts education was to prepare these people to lead society, to lead uh, various fields. And if you see the history of Western classics, a lot of that has come out. Similarly, we had uh, what, what we could call the liberal arts version of what was taught in, in India. If you remember, and if you can go back to our old books, uh, whether it was um, you know, the classic Dronacharya uh, 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 teaching the Pandavas, uh, or you had every uh, royal family and king going to a Gurukul. And that was the Indian version of liberal arts, a comprehensive, well-rounded education uh, in which you learned everything that was needed to be learned in order to be a, a good person, a productive a member of society, and most importantly, someone who could take a long-term leadership role there. Now, of course, over years, people have, have uh, and particularly in the last 100, 150 years, uh, what is liberal arts, what constitute liberal arts has been in a bit of a flux. And honestly, um, there is no right answer. And so that brings me to my first very, very important point. First, whenever you're talking to somebody about liberal arts, ask them, what do you mean by liberal arts? And because if you put five different professors in the same room from all over the world or even India, they would disagree with each other on what liberal arts means because it's such a big term. Instead, what's more productive perhaps to focus on what does it mean to them? What are the career options? Uh, what does learning liberal arts according to them look like? And these are questions you should ask both the schools, the colleges, uh, anyone who's trying to do any career counseling. Uh, so you are on the same page. They're not wrong. They are just looking at it from a very different perspective. Now, some of the very common uh, and different definitions of, of liberal arts, you have on one extreme, which is uh, perhaps the, the, the St. John Smith methodology where you have a liberal arts degree. And what a liberal arts degree means is that uh, the college says, look, we know uh, what a comprehensive education looks like. And all of you are going to do that same education and we'll do it one year, two year, three year, four year, and you would graduate with a degree that says something like a bachelor's of liberal arts. And that is one extreme view of liberal arts, which is saying, look, we had a great education system back in the day. This is something like the Gurukul system. And here are what we constitute. Obviously, however, please be careful when you go for a general liberal arts degree is to understand what's included. Because back in the day, what was included was a lot of science, a lot of technology, a lot of engineering, a lot of sports, a lot of this. The modern day version of that, many, many schools and colleges say they are a comprehensive liberal arts, but they restrict themselves to a few subjects. The other extreme, uh, which is what the APJ Satya University does, uh, is we say that we take what we call the liberal arts approach to education. And the liberal arts approach to education is very simple. Uh, we say that, look, there is one world, no boundaries, right? So just because you want to say there's physics, mathematics, there's economics, there's psychology, 
that's something that we humans create. But there is only one earth, there is only one world. And to us, a liberal arts philosophy essentially says that anybody who learns, and whether they take a specialization in engineering, or they take photography, or they take drama, all of it is a reflection of the same world. And therefore, the teaching style that you learn, by definition, has to be interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Because, and, and, and I don't worry, I'll, I'll give specific examples of what I mean by that uh, um, a bit later on, so you can understand what that looks like in, in the real world. You have those two extremes, the St. John Smith's system, which is a Bachelor's of Liberal Arts, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that and why is that very useful. And you have our approach, which is on the other extreme, which says everything is liberal arts and everything should be taught using a liberal arts approach, and that creates better people. Both are right, but you have to decide whether which one is for you. Now, for the vast majority of you, you're going to fill in somewhere in between. You're not going to go to the St. John Smith's extreme, and we'd love to have you at our extreme, but if you want to figure out something in the middle, you have different forms of liberal arts, such as, uh, such as particular subjects. So, for example, some people would say, you know, arts or humanities or something is a liberal arts subject, or psychology is a liberal arts subject. Uh, that is something which uh, can also be on the spectrum, but it's not a traditional definition of, of a liberal arts. And I'm happy to answer those specific questions on those subjects as well, because many of them are tremendously exciting. And I think the history of India, particularly in the last 20, 25, 30 years, this obsession with lawyer, uh, doctor, engineer has been great for the country, but has not worked for a large number of students only maybe 10 to 20% of those top uh, professions end up making any money, having a career, and the most importantly, enjoying themselves, enjoying life, enjoying their academic career. And to me, that is the true ha uh, harbinger of success, is that not that, that you're good at something, but you enjoy doing it. Because even if you're good at something and you don't enjoy doing it, you'll never be able to take it to the extreme level you need to in order to truly succeed in life. Uh, I have Sanjeev. There is no PPT being showed because I want to make sure that uh, uh, you know we are on point and that we look at questions rather than taking to a boring, boring lecture uh, on you know what is definition, this, that, etc. So I'm going to go uh, for uh, uh, step by step to a little bit talk about the both extremes of liberal arts and talk about, but more importantly, uh, how the world is changing and why that is so important when you're looking at any career, forget about liberal arts, but in any other field. If you look at uh, 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 what uh, has happened in the last 20, 30 years, there are certain things. And when, when I started ASU as one of the co-founders, what we really looked at uh, is we went and asked uh, chairmen and CEOs of top companies all across the world. I was in the audience when Steve Jobs gave his famous address in 2005. Uh, we talked to the, the presidents and the provosts or the top Ivy League uh, colleges in the world, and we asked them that, look, what does the 21st century education look like? And a couple of points became very clear. First, the clear feedback was, look, uh, things are moving at a very rapid pace. What does rapid pace mean? Uh, it means that in two to three years, if you ask a company that I'm going to hire this person, what their job description is going to be? Companies are struggling to answer that uh, today. The companies that all of us know that came up in the last five years, 15 years ago, those top companies didn't exist. The top companies that were there 15, 20 years ago don't even exist now. So you have the pace of things have been changing incredibly fast. And that means a lot more competition. So uh, whether it's in the marketplace or whether uh, is it as an individual, you are competing. You're not just competing uh, in your local economy anymore, you're competing against the world. You know, many of you are young and you don't remember a world where you, know, you could not buy a product that, that, uh, that was sold somewhere abroad. Uh, you, whatever company or product you set up in that country, that pretty much was restricted to that market. But now, any product or service you have in, in India, you have to compete against the US, you have to compete against China. Now, governments are seeing that but that means that companies are changing at a very fast level. So that speed and adaptability is something that they're really looking for. The second thing that is happening because of that, and which I call it the expiry of knowledge. This is a very important thing to understand. What does it mean that 
knowledge expires. Uh, this fundamental knowledge, right? And fundamental knowledge, uh, which has tried and tested for hundreds of years, wisdom, experiences, that tends to remain the same. But a lot of specialist knowledge changes all the time. Uh, you know, if you're an accountant, every, every uh, month there's a new circular, there's a new system of doing accounts that change. As a technologist and an engineer, I don't have to tell you uh, how many different patents, how many different uh, papers come out every single month that completely transform your field. But for me, I love to use the example of of a subject like history. How does the knowledge of history change? History by definition is, you know, going to the past. So how is the past changing? But you'll be surprised. Uh, almost every three months, every six months, people use new and new technology is to uh, understand what happened in history. And that could be, for example, discovering, and which to me was one of the big changes that happened in the 10 years, that uh, the pyramids were not built by slaves, but by volunteer labor by people. Uh, of how the human body and understanding of where the key links of evolution change because people were able to do carbon dating. When new fossils come up and you learn new things, or you know, there could be a massive archeological dig that happens and they discovered, oh wait, we have to completely rethink on, on how history happened. Or even more, more modern history, we've had so many cases where documents have come to light, uh, governments have declassified things. So knowledge expires. But if knowledge expires, what does that mean for us? What it means for us, and this is where the hallmark of a liberal arts education is, whether it's on either extremes or in the middle, a true hallmark of a liberal arts education is preparing you for lifelong learning. High adaptability, as because it's a huge amount of competition, lifelong learning because your knowledge will expire. And I can guarantee you, uh, two years from now as you go out for school, you'll forget a whole bunch of things when you graduate from college, you will forget a whole bunch of things. And many of you uh, years later will, will, will say that, look, what I learned in college doesn't apply to anything that I do in my job. Uh, and that's perfectly fine because the, the fundamental thought of an education is not so much just to give you a temporary training or a skill. There's a difference between why we say educated and trained. Training is for a skill. Education is for allowing you to create a system in your head a mentality and attitude and skill and behavior that sets you up for this expiry of knowledge problem. Every year, every month, uh, you are able to learn more and more and you have a an habit and the ability to learn all of this. Uh, the last bit I'd like to connect is why liberal arts matters so much and particularly the version I love, which is the comprehensive liberal arts that every field can be taught, one world, no boundaries. Let's take something and, and I love using this example because you know, everybody's enamored. How did, how do you create an iPhone? Who creates an iPhone? What is the discipline of uh, the degree that allows you to create an iPhone? Some people said, well, computer science, okay. Mechanical engineering, great. You have to choose the materials in this. Uh, material science, because you have to figure out how to get that glass done. Uh, psychology, because you have to understand what, uh, how people love to interact with the system. Economics, how will the supply chains work? Uh, you have to have project management, project managerial skills. You have to have instrumentation tech, uh, uh, techni uh, technicians who come in. Uh, you have to have a whole bunch of different things. And I could go on, by the way, and, and I did this list. It was something like 35, 40 different professions that had to be involved to get that iPhone uh, from just an idea into your hands every day. That means, however, that the world prizes people who can talk to all 35 people. And one of the things we do at APJ at the University, which is the other extreme of the liberal arts, is what we say, look, you must have a working knowledge of 11 different disciplines and fields so that when you're sitting in the boardroom as an engineer, as a psychologist, as an astronomer, you are able to understand what everybody else is doing and bring it all together. And that person, in my opinion at least, is the most significant contributor. Each person does their own thing, but the person who can bring everything together, that is something which is truly unique. And that I think for me is a critical aspect of liberal arts education. Let me walk it back. First, how adaptable you are to change because change is gonna happen all the time. Look at COVID-19. Can anybody e even imagine the way we would be having this conversation or the way our, our schools would be running or our college opportunities would have been even sitting in February or March? And the huge difference is who, who are those who are able to change 
right after the lockdown and who froze. And I would say those who had a lot more of a liberal arts education were more fashion to change. And the second, of course, the expiry of knowledge. Um, you had to learn everything anew. And if you, if you continuously know how to do that, that is a lifelong skill that never goes away. And third, bringing everything together because you are able to speak over multiple disciplines and have that multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary ability. And so the crux of a liberal arts education, the advantages are bringing all of these three things together. Now, what does that mean in terms of a career? Because at the end of the day, it's very nice for me to be saying all these wonderful things and uh, there are a lot of people and you know, Steve Jobs certainly loved liberal arts and he would give a lot of lectures on them and Einstein loved liberal arts and despite being a hardcore physicist, he loved it and he gave a bunch of lectures on it. But in today, 21st century, what does that mean in terms of a career? And uh, if you have to separate that into two particular halves. The first half is those three most important things I talked about. And by the way, those three things is what companies are looking for. Companies have flattened. They don't have 11 degree of hierarchies. They want people who can make fast decisions, who are constant learners, who can talk and bring everything together. And so from the first thing, the moment you have a liberal arts-based education, you can go out with confidence. Uh, and the companies love that. They love that ability to do all those three things. And it shows, it shows in your interview, it shows in your background, and most top companies respect and understand having been trained in a liberal arts background, you bring that to the table. The second aspect is, particularly at the undergraduate level, people are looking at you for your mind to be trained. Much more important. Now, if you look at what a lot of things would happen in the engineering space, you had all these people who learned chemical, mechanical, all these went to IITs, everything else. And what did they do? They all became software engineers. What was the point of them going to college? For a mechanical engineer, if they only want to do software engineering. Oh, I went to IIT because as mechanical because I wanted computer science, but my rank didn't come, so I took mechanical and then using the IIT name or whatever name I went to think. That makes no sense. And they don't make great engineers. They're not the people who form companies. They're not the people who go out uh, very rarely. And there are only a few names of people who pivot successfully on that. And so my recommendation is that companies understand that a lot of times what you do in college is training your mind, is delivering an impressive uh, idea and a result. That has very little to do what job you would be really good at. I mean, it's a couple of years of transition period and you do have to back it up with a lot of other courses, but that's a, another fundamental thing you should know. So I'm gonna pause there and let's look at uh, uh, a couple of questions uh, and, and, you know, I, I want to really spend some time linking this concept directly to your questions on your career options and which, and, and you can do me a big favor for those who are considering liberal arts seriously or, or liberal arts subject, as they say, seriously, drop a question. Uh, I, because it's such a broad field, I don't want to cover, uh, you know, all the, you know, 50, 60 options that are there. I want to make sure I'm speaking to what you need to know. Now, the first time I am going to take a question, which is right on top for me, is Ayush uh, Devan. Uh, Sir, taking hold of to, uh, today's uh, scenario, the pandemic has opened new scope of options. So in the new future, what are the subjects or careers coming up, like a facet or a field or a particular sector you could tell such as health? I think that's a fantastic question. But I want to take uh, that to the pause. See, a lot of people get in, I interview a lot of people. So I... Uh, in, in my own business, we manage around 5,000 people. We hire about three to 400 people a year. And uh, my favorite question to ask them is, why did you pick this subject in college? And each one of them, usually, I think almost 70%, particularly in India, uh, the answers in the US and Europe are very different, say, uh, I thought bohat scope. Someone told me that this you will make a lot of money if you enter in this space. Um, I don't think that's a very good idea to go after. I was I, just saying that, oh, there's going to be this great field. And, uh, you know, if I just figure out a way to get there. So I, I want to put that on a pause. Don't chase money in the field because if you don't like it, you're going to get into trouble. But there are certain things which I think post COVID-19 are definitely fields which are going to really, really go up. Uh, and I'm going to start with the ones that not many people really look at. One, 
I think definitely agriculture is really going to go up. Uh, Prime Minister Modi and a lot of other uh, uh, senior leaders have made huge changes in the way the agriculture system runs in India and across the world, revolutionary changes. You will not recognize farming in two to three years. Uh, and this is a great time to enter the market, whether in terms of a um, understanding how agriculture works, whether in terms of a management systems or, or a degree in management in agriculture. Uh, and there are a lot of liberal arts uh, systems that sort of click, click into that. The second, I'm very excited about healthcare and healthcare, both in the digitalization space of healthcare, uh, but also for me, the big, big one is psychology. Uh, psychology and psychiatry. And please note, those are two very different things. Psychiatry is different, psychology is different. But I think uh, the, the world will need so many, so many psychologies. India has a massive shortage and the world loves and needs psychology. And, and psychology in particular, because it goes into behavioral economics, uh, everybody from the tax department hires behavioral economics to companies. And right now, psychology is the favorite, favorite of every major company in tech, whether it's gaming or this, because you're trying to understand how your customers think, how they react, how they buy. I think psychology for me is a massive, massive field there. The third big one uh, for me is anything to do with, uh, with, with uh, chemistry and chemical engineering. Uh, I know not consider a very sexy subject, uh, Sekra, but I think chemistry and particularly the uh, subjects associated with chemistry are fantastic. And, and, and taught from a liberal arts perspective, particularly, I'm not so happy with the traditional chemistry, but if you're able to combine it, as you do in ASU, with a liberal arts philosophy, you understand how to take that chemistry and apply it in all sorts of different fields. And um, that's not the point which I missed out. Having that liberal arts connection to any other skill or discipline really makes you prepared for the next thing. So those are the three fields off the top of my head that I would love to look at. Um, and uh, let me take a couple of more questions. You said liberal arts is a huge topic. Can you give a fair idea what professions could come under liberal arts? <laughs> That's a great question. So me sitting on the APGS at the university side will say every single profession is a liberal arts profession. One world, no boundaries. You give me a profession and I will say that's a liberal arts profession. But more to what you really want to know and the answer uh, to ask. Uh, so again, two different things, right? You have very traditional subjects that, that are considered, you know, the social sciences, you know, uh, from sociology to humanities to arts to all of that. Um, some would even put mathematics under core mathematics, uh, not the engineering form of uh, uh, mathematics um, uh, into that definition. Uh, but then you have your traditional uh, economics, sociology, psychology, political science, public policy. Uh, all of all of those sort of come into that huge liberal arts. But like I said, there's just so many things. You know, you have you have both biology and philosophy as a as a, as a liberal arts subject, and that's different, by the way, from biotech, which is which is considered an engineering. And so they are very different. But by the way, this also uh, includes uh, you know his uh, historic thing, uh, astronomy, music. Uh, all of those, those I think are all there. So hence my hesitation um, that, uh, uh, you know, why I want to not focus on, on, on just on a liberal arts as a, as a, uh, as a catch all for everything. Um, but there's some professions which directly link into that. And in my opinion, all of them link into that. And, and I encourage you look, look at the fortune 500 CEOs and see how many of them have a liberal arts education. You would be very, very surprised. Ooh, oh, I have some anonymous attendee, which is the best subject in liberal arts? <laughs> That's a great question, but no, uh, I'm not, I, I cannot have a preferential. I love them all. Uh, I am very, very partial to literature, psychology, economics, but I love biology, I love anthropology, I love sociology, uh, theater, speech, creative writing. These are all fantastic. And this is why I tell everybody that you should when, when you have a liberal arts approach, it's not just about picking one subject. It's about understanding all of them and bringing them together in a cohesive whole. And then if you want, particularly in a master's perspective, specializing in one or more. Uh, Joanna Jacob, I love this question. So if I go into liberal arts and end up loving a particular subject, will I have equal opportunities compared to my peers who may do a proper degree 
uh, in that subject specifically, Joanna, you will be much better off because I presume you're a smart person. It's a great question. And I can't, of course, answer for how, how much, how hard you're willing to work, uh, what's your inherent talent in the subject, how much you love it. But I can tell you this, in everybody who I've met, people who have a very strong fundamental base uh, in liberal arts and then go on to specialize, always do much better. There's a reason, for example, in the US, you cannot get a bachelor's law degree. They always want you to get an undergraduate degree and then get a law degree because uh, you know, at the end of the day, they're saying, look, if you're going to be a lawyer, you have to first have some, fun some fundamental foundation in education. Very similarly, a lot of top universities in the US uh, don't have an undergraduate um, uh, business degree because they want you to take a subject or a broad-based liberal education and then do a master's or in a specialization. So I think you're going to be better off. I'm going to caution there. If you are trying to earn a very, very, very specific uh, subject discipline, you might have to take a little bit of a detour track in life. I did. I highly recommend all of you do that as well. Uh, but if you look at long term, 10, 20, 30 years, you will absolutely be better off than all your peers uh, if you have that benefit of that education. And for the three reasons I told you, you'll have a much broader understanding of a wide variety of fields and you'll be able to really uh, learn new things better than them. And most importantly, companies will love you because you bring a lot more than that highly specialized skill. One of the biggest problems that happen is that you know, 10 years in, most people, and there are some exceptions, but most people uh, top out on their skill levels in that specialized field. So your peers would take that degree and it'll be valid for what, four or five years, their knowledge is expired. What do they have that'll get them through the next five and they're gonna be you know, work experience. In your case, you'll have that fundamental, fundamental base of knowledge and you can go up. Uh, Shravangi Zayed, how has the pandemic and current situation affected the carry option? Shravani, I am not going to um, uh, you know, mince words. It's a terrible situation out there. Uh, about 35% of companies in India and in the SME segment are going to close. The good news is for most of you, and you know, I got my MBA back in the 2008 uh, crisis, so I saw this firsthand, but most of you, uh, by the time you graduate, I think you are gonna enter a market which is stronger, better, more re re resilient, and with a lot more options. I think what, for me, which gives me a lot of, lot of, of uh, hope, um, uh, is that because of COVID-19, there's been a huge number of reforms that have been pending in India and across the world, huge lot of assumptions of what people can and cannot do, and those have fundamentally broken down. And when those have broken down, you're gonna see a massive roaring back of business, massive roaring back of jobs, and a lot of opportunities, particularly for young people coming in, uh, because a lot of the skills that are coming in post COVID-19 is something you will be much better at than maybe those 10, 15 years you're senior. So I think it's a fantastic time uh, to be here, and particularly if you're gonna graduate in two to four years. Uh, Vandani Murjani, uh, a big chunk of students and parents are still obsessed with degree like BSc, BTech, uh, and undermine BA. And then I see it depends what it is. I'll give you an example, right? Uh, a great graphic di uh, designer with a BA in art and design is usually paid twice as that much as an engineer in most companies today. Uh, a BA in psychology, um, it depends which country you go to. Some have BA, some have, have, uh, have BS. Uh, done well pays a lot more. And so I think it's also the problem is, and, and, and I take full fault for this as well. Uh, industry has not explained to parents what they want and they want to hire. And this is why you see so many students in India uh, who have graduated from good colleges with bachelors of science, BTECs, and either they then go into some other career because their parent wanted that BTEC or BS and okay, here parent, you have got it, now let me do what I love. Or they come out and they are horrible at it. They hate their jobs. You hate your job, your company hates you. So please, uh, I highly recommend um, uh, that you do what you're good at not your dream, everybody wants to be a celebrity and a singer and a dancer and all of that. Do what you're good at and do what you love. And if you can find a way to intersect those, that is what will make you most successful. Anonymous attendee, what skills can we students develop at school level to be successful in our careers? I love that question. I'm gonna give you one simple skill, continuous learning. 
when I was in school and other people were in school, and I'm not that old, but there are a lot of people who are older than me, we did not have access to the top course materials from the top universities for free at a drop of a hat. That's something all of you have. If you wanna see what a course looks like, go online to edX, go online to any online, all the top courses in all the universities are there for free, try them out. The biggest mistake you will ever make is uh, listen to someone like me and decide on a course. When today in 2020, you can take that course online at a top university and see what it feels like, see what it looks like, see at a college level, or at a top college, what does that course look like? And learn it for yourself. You don't have to finish it, at least you'll get a flavor. And so at a school level, that is the biggest skill. Don't just get a degree, don't just get a high school A education. Every three months, I promise myself and I get a new certificate course, which I take online start that in school. If you can get four or five certificates from external colleges and different, different systems, whatever you're interested in, uh, people will be impressed. Colleges will be impressed. Uh, and it'll, and it's a skill that will follow you forever because your college cannot prepare you for the entire world. You have to take a, you have to take responsibility for your own learning. And the day each one of us take responsibility for our own learning, that is the day when there is nothing that can stop us. Don't wait for your parents to make you learn. Don't wait for your school to make you learn. Don't wait, wait for your college to make you learn. Don't wait for a future employer to make you learn. Learning is our personal responsibility and we must take responsibility. And that is the one skill that you have to do. Uh, question, question, question. Nakira Vats, I'm really confused whether I should choose arts, commerce with maths. Uh, do help me. Nakira, uh, you know, both are fine. And, you know, I, mean, I must apologize. I mean, we, we don't do this at APJ South University, but a lot of people, you know, in India, you have to choose one or the other. It makes no sense because particularly in college, you should be able to choose whatever you want. And I, uh, for me, it's very simple. I don't, I don't have enough information to help you out on this. Uh, but in general, uh, I would definitely look at arts or commerce with, with maths, depending on what would you like to do next, if specifically if you're going into India. And, and right now, if you're still confused, I would go online to edX. I would find the courses that those lead to, whether it's your BCOMs or your BAs and such, and see what you want to do. It's a, it's a big decision, and I'm very sorry you have to make it, but that's the way our Indian system is designed right now. Uh, so the, the, the decision you have to make has less to do with what other people think but what you think in two years you have to do. And now in today's day and age, you do not need to ask uncle, auntie, me, random person, go online, find that course, take the introductory course, spend four hours on it and you'll know. So uh, choose that based on the final course, but try that final course and try it while you're still in class 10th. Don't wait for that long. Sharia Kapoor, I've, all, I've already taken humanities. Congratulations, love humanities. And not clear about what carriage to look forward to and what course to open, notable options are there. Sharia, everything is open. You can be an anthropologist, you can be a history professor, you can be a psychologist, uh, you can be an artist, uh, you can be a graphic designer, you can be a UI technician, you can be a healthcare expert. Uh, there are an incredible number of careers that a, that a humanity degrees can take you. And don't let it be restricted by this thinking that we have, uh, oh, science, 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 and science and plus science and plus science. You have an incredible number of, of options. Uh, do explore them. Uh, and please, I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the top careers today is applied pharmaceuticals. Applied pharmaceuticals is based off on a biology uh, liberal arts course that goes into the farm industry. Highest paying job, uh, the richest people in India all run pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical companies. Nobody takes it, they first fail to become doctors then they begin to pharmaceuticals. So there are lots of very good career options that are available there that uh, people haven't heard of. So please go research, don't depend on people to. There are very good reports from top tier consulting companies on what are the skill gaps in India. Find what those are, look at those skill gap reports then see, is it something that you are good at? Take a sample course online. Within a weekend, you'll be able to make a good decision. Monica, can you please point some career aspects for a combination degree in psychology and sociology? Oh my God, that's such a great combination degree. 
wow, where do I start? Uh, so Monica, essentially core, what are, you, what, what are you learning? You are learning two things. You're learning how human behavior, how human individuals think, and you're learning how societies think and act, right? The individual and society. And that's applicable everywhere. Uh, you can, I mean, where do you even start? Uh, everything from, uh, from helping coming up with public policy to think tanks, uh, for working for companies who want to launch new apps or products or systems and look at customers' behaviors, things, uh, customer service and uh, organization design is a fantastic place. General consulting as well, absolutely brilliant. A career in marketing is very obvious, very, very obvious uh, for this degree. In fact, it's pretty much designed for that. So you have a lot of options. So just remember, any discipline that requires you uh, to think of the individual level, as well as think uh, uh, of society at large. And that pretty much covers a wide berth. And, uh, but again, um, pick something that you really want to do. Anonymous attendee. Can I choose commerce after 10 to go for digital marketing? Absolutely. And what I love about things like dig digital marketing is, uh, is evidence-based hiring, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you know if a person's a great uh, digital marketeer? Not the degree they have or what they've learned, but you make them run a campaign. If they do a great job, they're a great digital marketer. They do a poor job, guess what? No one's hiring them before. So you don't need, uh, you can, if you want to become a digital marketeer, uh, it doesn't matter what you take in class 10th, 11th, 12th. What really matters is what you're taking outside school. Because if you really want to be a digital marketing expert, you should already be taking digital marketing courses when you're in class 10th, 11th, and 12th. Don't wait for college to start learning something if you're truly passionate about it. Uh, in fact, by that time, it's too late. If you're passionate about something, start learning it now. So you can know whether you want to spend four years of your life doing that, or you can do it now. And for stuff that's online, by the way, there are dozens of uh, websites like freelancer.com, Upwork, and there's all of those which are there where you can actually take live projects and at least try to do stuff. I always recommend everybody, whether they're in school even before class 12 or in college, if you, if you know what you're doing. A lot of us, including me, were super confused. But if you know what you want to do, uh, try your hand at it. Try getting live projects. Uh, do projects for other people. Figure out what you can do in your community, right? Uh, oh, I was saying, I am currently in class 10th. My parents have to say that PC, VM, and class opens up a lot of options. My target is track the UPSC, better produce arts, pursue postgraduate courses such as international relations, those of science, work hard, open up options to pursue my dreams. Anonymous attendee, figure out what you are good at. And if you want to crack an examination, you want to get hard marks, figure out what you're good at, right? If you're good at PCBM, take PCBM. If you're good at arts, take arts. Because what are people are going to look at you is, is they're going to see, okay, this is what you say you're on paper. Are you good at it, right? Nobody wants, to, I, I, people would rather hire a first class artist than a third class engineer for any job. And uh, that's why it's very, very important for you to choose, to choose, to choose what you really, really are good at, especially if you want to go for something like the UPSC, which is a very vast intake ability. Um, the UPSC doesn't really care. They have an exam. You have to go at the exam and then you have to go at the interview. Better to show up uh, top of your class, top of your college in a subject you love. And if you love the subject, you'll spend time on it. Otherwise, you'll keep big banging your head against the wall. You'll do it for PCBM or commerce or arts. You'll do it in college. You'll bang your head in masters. And you don't want to spend seven years doing that. Pick something you're good at. Not what you just love, but what you're good at. A lot of us, I love a lot of things which I'm not good at. I don't pick those things. And those are hobbies. Those are not my career. For which degree we should look after to become a pilot? So I'm a pilot. I got my pilot, private pilot's license years ago in 2006. Look, um, if you want to become a pilot, my opinion, go and read how to become a pilot, right? Uh, India particularly has some specific rules. You have to be a PCM graduate. That's not internationally. You don't have to be a PCM graduate to become a pilot. Uh, there are lots of schools which train you to be pilot, depending on your financial circumstances. You can go and get to getting a 
uh, you don't need to have a degree to become a pilot, okay? Uh, what I would definitely do is that if you want to become a pilot, get a degree in something that you're good at as a backup, right? We've seen what happened in COVID-19, what happened to pilots, and this goes up and down every year. So you want, so if, you, if your dream is to become a pilot, please do become a pilot. It's wonderful. I did. I loved it. It was brilliant. It took a long time and it's very difficult. And you have to find a great pilot, pilot school. And I, if you can afford it, highly recommend to look abroad uh, at some of the best pilot schools there. You can go and you'll get your license in three to six months. Uh, but get a degree in something you're good at so you have a backup. Uh, pilots are not paid as much as you think they are. And it takes a long, long time be before going to 100 hours, 500 hours, 1,500, 3,500. It, it takes years and years and years before you're in that commander cockpit seat. And you don't get paid very well until you hit that seat. So have a good backup degree that you can use. Is gaming a liberal arts? Absolutely. All great game designers are liberal art people. Seriously. Uh, it, it contains everything, literature, art, storytelling, uh, graphics, systems, uh, coding and programming. To me, even coding is liberal arts, but I'm an extreme person on that. But it, all of those sort of come together in gaming is definitely a liberal arts subject. Psychology, sociology, economics, you know, you all know in-game currency and stuff. But it goes to my thing. Gaming, again, is a very broad field. To bring a game to life, you need so many different fields working, working together. Why people in India make fun of physiology? I have no clue. Okay, I do know why they take physiology, make fun of physiology, but it's a superbly well-paying profession above. Uh, and, um, you know, I think particularly uh, as times go by and, you know, physiology going forward when it comes to sports law, um, uh, sports law, medicine, pharma, all of these physiology is Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. So people make fun of a lot of things. They don't know better. And nothing is more fun than doing something you really love and you're good at, becoming a top of your profession, earning a whole bunch of more money and a lot of more success and a lot of more satisfaction than all your peers. And you know that speaks more than anything else in what you do. Physiology has amazing. Tanish Tareja is studying in the US better than in India. Yes, but depending on which college you go to. There are a lot of good colleges in India. I like to think uh, APJ being one of them. Uh, a lot of bad colleges in India. In general, if you don't get into the top 30, 50 colleges in India, go abroad. If you can afford it, go abroad. Uh, if nothing else, it will expose you to something different. And long term, what you learn in the classroom is only going to be a small portion of what makes you successful. It's the new experiences, is the ability to connect with people, relate, bring things together, that make you successful in the long term. And so if you were in the US, by the way, and you asked me this question, I would tell you to come to India, for example, because I think that would really, really allow you to think more, it'll give you a different cultural experience, and it'll allow you to grow as an individual. For, for, the, for the people who leave their hometowns, leave their home countries, uh, they grow up very fast. When I meet a 21-year-old who has gone abroad uh, for their studies, and that could be anywhere in the world, uh, they are a they are an adult. They have skills. It shows in their work. Uh, if you go with someone who just went to the college right next to his own house and never went out and never did anything and never faced hardship in their personal life, they act like they're still in school. Big difference. It's a good experience. You should get it. Oh, great question, Anonymous. How do I discover what I'm good at? I know this sounds silly, but it is not silly at all. Uh, I tell people two things. First, discover what you're bad at. First, it's great. I have so many things I know I'm terrible at. Like I just can't do it, right? So if you can't discover what you're good at, at least figure out what you're bad at, right? And, he, and I'm going to be very careful because your parents are going to kill me if I, if, <laughs> if I don't sort of properly disclaim it. First, just because you've done something once or twice and you failed at it doesn't mean you're bad at it. Okay, anything worthwhile takes hard work. It takes hard work. No one gets good at something or loves something day one, you know, but if you work at it, you will get good at it, right? So just remember that. Second, the only way to become good or, or learn if you're good or bad at something is to try it. And trying doesn't mean you apply for a course, get into the course, one year later say this doesn't work. In 2020, please, you have all the options to try. You can try all these courses online, 
take the introductory course, try it out. And from the best, from the best. Earlier, my problem used to be when I used to advise students is that they didn't have options. They might learn from somebody local who may not be very good at the subject, but you can learn from the best now. Learn from the best online, right? If there's a field you want to try, if there is a discipline, a skill, a behavior, try it. Only then you'll know. But better to try now, learn now, than to do it for four years or three years and then learn halfway through and say, oh God, what, 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 what a big mistake I made. So the only, only thing to do uh, if you want to learn what you're good or bad at is to actually do it. And it's very easy to do in 2020. There's very less risk to do it in 2020. Please try, try. Uh, you'll get a lot more information about yourself. So if we have a love and passion for singing and dancing, then can we make it as a career? This is a very good question and a very dangerous question. One, uh, a lot of people have love and passion for singing and dancing. Very, very few people can turn it into a career. And the definition of a career is, are people going to pay good money to listen to you sing and dance? I don't know you. I don't know how great you are at this. Maybe you are a national award winner, singer and dancer. But I can tell you this, unless today you are so good, so good that you can call yourself at the top of the field, it's going to take years before you get good enough to earn money doing this. And so for those who are very passionate about things like acting, singing, dancing, I tell them this, look, uh, train hard, find a good career option that you're good at, use that time, energy, and effort and passion to become really, really good at singing, dancing, acting, whatever it is that you want, cricket, whatever it is that you want, right? But until you are that good, until you've put in 10,000 hours to achieve mastery, and that wait five years, seven, eight years, that's fine. If you're a great singer, you'll be fine seven, 10 years from now to be a great singer, right? Until then, it's not a career. And I always tell people, unless you are already so, so amazing that you're better than anybody else around you and better than any else at a national stage, remember the competition problem, right? You're not just competing against in your city or your state, you're competing against the world to become a singer and, and a dancer. Great hobbies, spend time on it, train yourself up. If you get good enough, you'll be able to transition. A lot of people have transitioned from you know, becoming you know, managers to stand-up comedians, right? Uh, but I very rarely recommend, unless you're one of those super, super insane, talented people that you know, uh, anybody who's at the top of the field would want to compete against you, that rarely happens. And so do something you're good at, pay the bills, keep that running, do your super hobby in depth on the side. If you get good enough there, you will transition. And the experience you have from this side of actually doing something productive, earning money real, will allow you to be better at that as well. Yes, an anonymous attendee who's talking about CLAT and law, a little bit of a convoluted question, but you're saying you are fantastic in humanity, searching good sources, but still giving some complaint on the CLAT. Am I doubt if it's the right field? Um, I can't answer that for you until you get a lot more information, but I'll, I'll tell you this. I love the law. I would have been a lawyer if I didn't get my MBA. And um, I fundamentally believe that a good lawyer, a really good lawyer, right? And India, like the rest of the world, only 10% of lawyers make any money. 90% make no money. Right? Being an average lawyer doesn't work anymore in the world. And that's the same in the US, that's the same in India. Get a good undergraduate degree in a highly specialized skill or liberal arts stuff like psychology or sociology or something, then do law and do law abroad if you can. Uh, I really, really think the future of law is highly specialized law, patents, trademarks, corporate mergers, uh, you know, intellectual property, sports, all of these highly specialized fields. That's where the real success is and that's where the most interesting cases are being fought. And so I highly recommend everybody who's thinking of law as your first degree, do something specialized you're good at. When you become a lawyer after that, you'll be a much better lawyer. You'll be a much higher paid lawyer and people will seek you out because you just, it's not just you understand the law, but you understand the subject the law is about, which is far, far more important. And that's where the world is going today. Anju Srivasa, what are the futures of prospects of photography? Lots of prospects. I had a very, very good friend 
who had a very, very high paying job as a HR manager who quit and became a professional photographer. So I can tell you the history. Uh, everybody was upset. He was upset. His wife was upset. His parents were upset. He earned nothing for three years, but then was very successful. I love photography. I think it's a fantastic field, but like dance, like arts, like anything, unless you're very, very, very good at it, very, very, very good at it and have the capacity and think time, I don't think you should make that as a prime uh, focus. Find a fine focus, add photography on top. Uh, there are in, in today's days of DSLRs and all of this, um, the things you can do with photography, the careers have come down. Uh, the prices you can command for photography because the content amount has increased so much have come down. So I do not recommend photography as a prime career these days. Uh, combine it with something and keep doing the keep doing the uh, uh, photography. It's, it's something like, you know, writing a book or doing uh, a literary activity. Uh, you need something to pay the bills, unless, you know, you, your parents have lots of money and they're willing to fund your photography ex uh, exhibition for 10 years. That could be the case. Still recommend, get something interesting with that. You know, get a sociology degree or a psychology of art, you know, and combine it with, with photography. You'll be a better photographer. Lots of questions, my apologies. Oh my God, 71 questions. What is the future of plastic manufacturing industry in India, Tanish? Tanish, I love this question. Brilliant, it's an amazing, amazing future. Uh, as much as I don't like plastics, plastics rule the world. And I'm not talking about the poly bags, you take it out. You know, every single thing really is, is going to connect back in, into plastics. You'll be shocked. And it's a great documentary on Netflix on, on how, where plastics are, please watch it. it It'll really explain to you where plastics goes. Oil is costs are coming down, which an oil price is directly included to plastics. Massive, massive boom. And not the cheap old plastics that you and I are used to, but high grade, brilliant polyplastics, uh, which are the future uh, of manufacturing. I think we are going to move from all the bad plastics to biodegradables, and that's a great thing. But, but really, really, really high end plastics. I think that's where it is. And if you can be in, in, if you can be in a material science engineering uh, or a field that intersects with plastics, fantastic, uh, brilliant. Uh, so Charta, is edX Coursera good to take online courses, pay for certification? Uh, absolutely. edX in particular, I love edX. I single-handedly say uh, most of my courses I take on edX because you get to see the top people in their fields. There are lots of other international great, great questions which are there um, and, and get the certification. It's worth the money. Uh, when employers want to employ you, they want evidence that you are a constant learner. One of the big questions people ask in your, in your interview is, how do you keep yourself updated? And most people say, I do internet. And the employers hate that. They hate that. Everybody does it. How is internet Googling an answer? It's not an answer. Hey, I have these five certificates in these wide variety of very interesting fields that make me a better, more qualified human being. That shows that you are actually a lifelong learner. So I now tell everybody, uh, get certified, get certified. Oh, the Antakur is Harvard liberal arts. Absolutely. Harvard probably is one of the top liberal arts schools in the world. Um, and they have a more expansive view of liberal arts than the St. John Smith's version. Stanford's liberal arts, MIT wants to become liberal arts. Uh, all the top universities in the world are liberal arts. Uh, t -t 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 I have commerce with Matt, so I want to ask what to do next in the future to go to Stanford University and become a chartered accountant. Well, problem number one, there is no accountancy course in, at Stanford University because they don't consider that as a classic, and Stanford's a liberal arts university with, uh, with research. Um, I. If you go to a place like Stanford, you're going to have to take economics uh, or management science and engineering. That's the closest thing you're going to get to see. And the CA stuff has to happen on the side. Uh, you cannot go to a top, top university in the world for accounting. It's not a classic liberal arts thing. But, uh, but, but a chartered accountant who knows, uh, who knows some other fields, psychology, sociology, all brilliant literature, who also has a CA degree, very interesting because like lawyers, CAs now need specialized knowledge and education much beyond um, just having a CA degree. Can you please tell me future prospects of archaeology 
Uh, that's a, a great question. Uh, archaeology. So I look at so have three, four different fields that archaeology takes. One says classic archaeology, and that is, um, and this is you have to have a PhD. You're not going to do anything in archaeology unless you get a PhD. You get in, you you do your bachelor's in archaeology, you do a master's maybe in, in archaeological history, you study under a, um, an archaeologist or a professor, and then you get a PhD. That's a very classic archaeology. You do research, you go on digs, you discover new knowledge. All of us are very happy to hear about all the things you do. Not so much Indiana Jones, but you know, um, uh, it's a fascinating subject, and I definitely love it. Um, alternatively, you take that archaeology, you learn the the field of archaeology, and you can apply to everything from from data extraction to archival systems to forensics uh, to all of that, because archaeology and forensics go hand in hand. There's a lot of scope in forensics and archaeology. I would love to find qualified forensic accountants who are archaeologists because they really understand how do you see history, how do you bring it together, how you use a little bit of evidence to go on that. You can go into criminology. Uh, there are a lot of government jobs also available for archaeologists. So I think that's a great question. Don't just think that this degree, therefore this job. Think of a degree in liberal arts as a way to train the mind in a system. What does that system get applied to? So for example, some of the most highest paid people I know took philosophy. And because philosophy taught at a top u u university in the world is one of the hardest subjects ever. And guess what? Philosophers make the number one hedge fund people in the world. They earn billions of dollars in finance because philosophy, the way of thinking in philosophy is the same way you think in a hedge fund. So again, just remember what the name of the degree doesn't often connect to the name of the job. A lot of degrees uh, which I hear end up connecting because the substance and form of the degree does this. Um, who? Uh, are design related careers like architect, interior design, web designers, wise choice to pursue currently? These are wise choices to pursue at any time. Uh, we have just scratched the surface of, we need so many more designers. We need so many more designers. Uh, in particular, India needs so many designers. But the difference, anonymous attendee, is are you a Namka designer, just in name only, or a real designer? And uh, a lot of people just do design. So when I interview designers, I ask them a simple question. Why did you choose this color? And if the answer is, I chose it because it looks pretty or it looks nice, you're not a designer. You're not. You're, an, you're a painter or an artist and then think. A designer is somebody. And by the way, at ASU, we focus on design think. And for us, what that means is that it's a design is a process, a disciplined process to solve any challenge or problem. So if you become a designer because you like painting, don't do it. If you become a web or a graphic designer because you love solving interesting psychological problems and you are good at art and you understand aesthetics, form and function, then absolutely. Uh, please be an architect, please be a designer, but don't do it because you wanted to paint and you thought, I want to paint, so let me become an architect. Or da, 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 da. And if you become an architect, please, for God's sake, take, take civil engineering some courses. Nothing is worse in India than an architect who doesn't understand civil engineering because you'll create all these pretty buildings and they'll all fall down and they'll be super expensive to build. So please don't do that. If you're an architect, take some courses in civil engineering so you know what you're trying to do. Sanjay Tata, I feel like I'm stuck with economic honors and history. Don't know what to come. I think it's a fantastic thing. Economics is, works everywhere. And history particularly, combined with economics, allows you to understand economics from a hist historic perspective. And particularly very, very important, whether it's policy, uh, whether it is uh, coming up with new models or systems or working in gaming, don't worry. It's a great field. Uh, you cannot go wrong with any economics or history conversation. Uh, anonymous attendee, what are the options available up after pursuing M MBBS? I presume by MBBS you mean uh, the classic doctor qualification and not some other degree. Uh, become a doctor, but also become a pharmaceutical scientist researcher or a pharmaceutical manager. Very good option there. We love new MBBSs coming in and, uh, and taking those options. Or you can do it and um, you know, do something completely different. Work on travel and travel exposure and see how that join Doctors Without Borders, uh, set up something completely new. MBBS is a wonderful general field and you can do a lot more than that. And internationally, particularly, there's a lot of people who have 
uh, doctor qualifications. You enter a wide variety of different fields because today the intersection of medicine across bioengineering, technology, humans, uh, sociology, psychology, history is everywhere. And being a qualified doctor while trying to reinterpret all these fields, absolutely fantastic. Oh, go to, 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 to. Can you please suggest which subject option will be better, PCM with economics or computer applications? Again, this is entirely up to you. Um, uh, my opinion, and this is just my opinion, take economics and learn computers on the side. Very easy to learn computers online. And if you have a general affinity for things, get an online uh, certificate in computer application. You will be able to do much more. And this is me speaking as, as a techie. If you're generally interested in computer science and computers, very easy to get a course and get a degree. Much harder for economics. But then you have to do it. Huh? Don't say, oh, I went to this webinar and then they said, oh, do economics. Only do economics if you can get that additional certificate in, com in computer application. It's very, very important to do that. So many questions. I'm trying to figure out ones that you haven't done before. Uh, It's a good question. What do companies, colleges, et cetera, look for a person which is different from what people look for in India? I want to change the question. Most good companies around the world look for the same thing, whether in India or abroad, look for the exact same thing, right? And most of it is, again, what I've covered, the ability to learn new things because they are worried that the world is changing. They can't have someone who comes in and then won't learn. Uh, there are a lot of people who after three years said, I want a promotion. Great. What have you learned in three years? Nothing. Why do you want a promotion? What have you learned? What is new? Why should you get a promotion? No one gets promotion just because they did the same job for three years, right? So second, uh, your attitude matters a lot. Are you lazy? Are you willing to work 24 seven? Do you bring passion to that job? And that's very important. And again, that's why I want you to pick something that you're good at and you're passionate about at the same time. Because you'd never be good at a job. People look that if you're really passionate, if, if I'm hiring a programmer, I want this person to love programming, not because you know somebody told him programmer and me bought scope, I have huge scope in programming. That's no point, right? So take something that you really, really, really love uh, and you're good at. And companies will love that because they know you'll come every day and they'll do it and you'll actually be good at it. So companies, good companies look for the exact same thing all over the world. And it's attitude, behavior, skill, uh, and ability to, to deliver. And uh, so don't think that companies abroad in India, there's any much difference. It's the same good company versus bad company. A bad company in the US is a bad company in India. Bad company in India is a bad company in the US. Just remember that. Okay, a lot of questions about study abroad and stuff. I'd love to take some of them, but I'm gonna focus on uh, the topic. Is being a YouTuber a full-time career? Please tell, yes, I know people who have, have uh, made it uh, um, uh, as a full-time YouTube career. Is it a career you can bet on? No, no, no. Like dancing, singing, acting, very few people can become a YouTube career. And even then, usually those people are either hired by companies to be professional YouTubers. So they say they're a YouTuber, but someone's hired them to be that way, or they're usually aiming for the US market. The Indian ad revenue right now for YouTubers is not enough for it to be a full-time, long-term career to an aspirational way that you want. So I would certainly not recommend it as a, as a first option as a career. If you can get a great career and become a YouTuber on the side and once you earn enough money, because even a YouTuber, you know, you're going to start with 100, 200, 500 followers and slowly, slowly, slowly increase. You're going to make no money, no money until you reach at least a million followers. And that takes time and that takes years. Uh, so, you know, have a primary career and go off it. I, I apologize. I've seen on the chat, some people are upset that I'm not getting to their questions. I have 107 questions in front of me. I'm trying to get, and don't worry, I'll stay an extra, uh, 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 you know, uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, to try to get through as many of them as possible. My deep apologies. And, you know, worst case scenario, we'll try to do another one of these. Uh, to, 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 to. If our parents are against the field we choose, then what do we do? Great questions. Give them data. There's a saying which I love, in God we trust, everybody else must bring data. Get the data. If you want to go to another field, go to your parents with data. What field you're going to, what is the career prospects, what is the average salaries that are being earned, why should you go into it, 
Who can you talk to do the work? Your parents are worried about you. They want you for you to succeed. If you can show them that the career track you want can be successful, right? Obviously there are some career tracks which are easier to convince parents because there is good data. Other career tracks have very poor data of success. Maybe then your parents are right. So talk to your parents, explain them with data. Don't explain them with emotions. Don't explain them with, oh, I want to do this or this or that. Have a presentation ready, do the effort. They will respect you that you have done the effort and you've gone to the next level in actually assembling all that you need to make a case. And uh, if your parents are still stubborn, they are still there trying to get either your school counselor or somebody to talk to them because if you've made a great case, if you have history, if you've proven, if you've taken an online course and you've aced it already, uh, most parents will be convinced with good data. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> How easy or difficult it is to publish your own book? Ouch, this is a very question. It is terribly difficult. I wanted to publish one for years. I published, it became a national bestseller for like a month and then Amish Party came and my book was you know, completely tossed out because everybody started re uh, reading him. It is very, very difficult to get published. And it's very, very difficult to get published for a couple of reasons. One, it is very difficult to write a book. Everybody thinks they can write a book. Trust me, I've written one. It is hard. Being a professional writer, I don't even consider myself a professional writer after I wrote that one book because I, I have met professional writers. I know how much they write, right? But if you really want to do it, you have to, there are a lot of great resources online. Unless you are writing at least 1,000 words a day, two 2,000 words a day, you're never going to actually be able to get a full book. Second, getting a publisher is very hard. And because everybody today now can write a book, everybody feels they have at least one good book in them. Um, it's a very incestuous industry. One of the reasons why I don't like the industry is that like movies, like film, like cinema, they only give it to their best friends. Uh, if you want to do it first, become an editor in one of these companies and they will give you a, a publishing deal much quicker than if you're just a random person who's going to do it. You can always self publish lots of great platforms. Amazon has a very good platform, which I love if you want to self publish your own book. Uh, but obviously, uh, unless you're a super marketing person, you, I, I I don't think you want to make money. I'll give you a stat. Uh, in India, the average number of English books that are sold for an author is 5,000. Think about that, 5,000 in the entire country. Steve Jaws' biography sold 60,000 copies in India. Chetan Bhagat's top books year by year sell about 1 lakh copies. And there are only three people in India who sell more than 1 lakh. My own was something like 35, 40,000. And that was a rare case. Very rare case because I timed the market right. So if most people are selling five to 10,000 copies of books max and all your named authors, so-called uh, on television, I'm an author, you are selling five to 10,000 copies of their book. It's not enough money. So most of, there's a reason why every single author who has crossed 100,000 has an MBA. And I'll let, let, go down the list of the top authors. All of them have MBAs because we're very good at marketing and they don't make money from their books. They make it from all sorts of other things. Uh, t -t 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 should we pursue interior design or web design in India abroad? Both have very good options. We have a fantastic design institute. I love it. It's benchmark of the world. You have, there are very few design institutes in India uh, and you can do both places. Just remember to put in the hard work. Don't go because you like pretty things. Go because you want to become a designer because you're trying to solve a problem or challenge. The biggest disappointment I see what happens is when you have designers who go in because they have so much expression to do. I want to do this. They meet their first client. The client says, I want this. The designer says, no, 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 we should do it this way. And they never have another client. You are as a designer, your job is not to give your personal expression. That is an artist's job. That is when you have a gallery in a painting, you are paid as a designer to do what the client wants, but bring your own interpretation into it as well. So please be careful. Both are good in India. Both are good abroad. There are very few schools in India. Most of them are really good. Also recommend you going abroad, particularly love the design schools in Europe. Uh, highly recommend them. Do we really have to, do we have to be really good in the subjects for the profession we want to opt for? Great question. Yes and no. Yes, for certain subjects, right? If you want to become a mathematics uh, guy and you're bad at math, no, 
<laughs> not going to happen, right? But a lot of times the profession has nothing to do with the subject that's been taught in college. And this is why I highly encourage people to go on to edX, go on to these online platforms and connect those two dots. And because sometimes the profession you want to be has no use for the degree that is being given on it. A classic example for me, you know, one is literature and one is computer science. People take literature because they want to write books and become authors. No, there's no link, right? Just because you went to literature doesn't mean you're going to become an author. Most authors, great authors actually never took literature in, in college. Very sim similar to computer science. A lot of top computer science people did not have computer science in college. Um, and that's just the way it is because college trains your mind for something. A profession is a lot thing. One of the reasons why I always love liberal arts is because of that. It's because in the real world, it's not about just knowing one small fact very well. It's about connecting all the dots. And the liberal arts education is usually better at connecting the dots than just going into a very narrow field. How can we gain interest in studying? That's a great question. Uh, first, figure out how you, how you learn, right? The biggest problem we see in India is we assume everybody learns the same way. And so a lot of people think that, um, you know, I'm just bad at studies. Right, I was a terrible person at studying. It was very difficult for me. It's still various, but when I figured out how I learn, figured out how I absorb concepts, um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, find faculty and professors who work with the way your brain works. I was very lucky in finding those in college. Uh, I love my college experience. It was absolutely brilliant because I found faculty members. I was able to choose faculty members uh, who taught the way I learned, and which is why I really encourage all of you to take online courses. Find just because it's a great faculty member, maybe their method doesn't work for you, right? So studying doesn't have to be, and I apologize, you're in India, your board exams is that nothing you can do about it, but if you can figure out a way that uh, makes it interesting for you, that you study. Oftentimes, some people can't do it by reading, some people have to he hear, there are documented learning differentials in people. Um, absolutely, and then study what you love beyond a point. I mean, you're not, you do have to give your board exams. You do have to do your entrance exams. I'm sorry about that. It's India. If you can skip and go abroad, please do. Uh, but otherwise, if you are doing what you love and learning what you love, you'll have no problem studying. Mr. Elon Musk said that artificial intelligence is going to conquer the job sector meant for all humans in less than five years. Do you think that artificial intelligence will be implanted in India or is there a lot of unemployment here? Great, 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 great question. Um, so three quick answers. First, uh, India is going to resist artificial intelligence. I had, uh, I and Mr. Nidin Gatkari had a, uh, our cabinet minister, who's also transportation minister, had a talk. We were, uh, it, was, it was a public talk with each other and he told, no, I will never allow driverless cars in India. I think that's a mistake. I think he should. I told him that, but uh, because he's worried about job losses. Uh, but post COVID-19, I think, look, I think machine learning uh, is going to start taking away a lot of very, very repetitive jobs that doesn't exist. Um, I love Elon Musk. I think he's a fantastic person. I don't think it's going to be five years time. I think in five years, we would have demonstrated that a large number of jobs could be taken over by AI. And, and, and I don't like the word AI because we haven't reached AI yet. Everything is just relabeled as AI. Every time I see AI, I ask, how is this AI? And then they can't answer. So 99% of what you're seeing is not AI. People have just put the name AI on top to make it branded as AI. It's still machine learning. It's, 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 it's still advanced algorithms. It's still heuristics. Um, I think India is going to face a huge employment, uh, unemployment crisis. It already is here. And that is why all of you need to work hard. This is an age of competitiveness. Uh, there is no jobs are not going on T's. No one's going to hire you just because you exist. You are not entitled to a job. Uh, you either have to uh, be exceptional, you have to work hard, and you have to be good at what you do. And that's why I encourage people to do what they're, what they're passionate about and what they're good at, more importantly because being a third rate engineer is not gonna get hired anymore. So find out if you wanna beat our artificial intelligence in the future, not now, five years, 10 years, 20 years, find out the field you can be number one in. Because number one in a human in number one in a field usually can beat artificial intelligence hands down. Um, if you are third class in a field, yeah, you're done. Someone's, uh, your job is gonna go. So please, Pick a field you can be number one in, or at least number two. 
being number three in any field is not going to help you in any way. Uh, Sir, I'm studying a BA program uh, in BN psychology from the Lady Sri Ram College. Hey, my mom went there. Great college. And uh, as always faces answering my relatives, they often don't seem to understand the value of just a basic BA and considered useless, how to explain the importance. Monica, look, honestly, don't bother. Ignore them. Work hard. Figure out what you want to do next. Once you graduate, once you're successful, they'll come and apologize to you. Right. If they don't understand it, don't waste. Why are you worried about what they think? You're there now. You're working hard. You're doing stuff. Uh, let them say what they want to say. You know better. Have self-confidence. Go do something great with that degree. Uh, make sure you do something with that degree. Take extra classes. Skill yourself up. And in four to five years, they'll keep quiet. It's very different if you're trying to do that degree, but you're already there. That's fine. It's a great college. It's a great degree. Don't worry about it. Don't let them get you down, right? But have focus, figure out what you want to do with that degree and then do something and then show them what you've done. They'll be, they'll acknowledge you. You don't need to worry about what they think right now. You your entire life to tell them how wrong they were. Is home science and science the same thing? No, it's not. Uh, well, yes, it is. Let me explain. Um, science, is the core science is the description of nature. Home science is a scientific approach to managing the economic conditions of a home. I love home science. I think it's fantastic. I think everybody in India should learn home science. At least one mandatory class on home science for every single person, we would have much better citizens of the country. Um, but home science is effectively the science of managing a home, a household, very important skills, accounts, economics, management, um, uh, nutrition, the modern version of home science is very difficult. And it's an absolute and essential degree and skill. Um, it's just science applied to the home. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, but if you're trying to do home science, take it to the next level. Again, number one in home science. Don't be number three in home science. No one is going to work with number three. If you love to dance and do math, can that be a part of a career? Absolutely. There are a lot of places where dance and math interact both in the creative and performance arts. Uh, kind of think about this, right? Every motion capture, every motion capture picture, animation, game, game, all is the combination of math and dance, right? It's a brilliant field. Movement and mathematics. Sports, for example, you know, somebody hits a bat. You know how much they pay to analyze that swing? That's a dance move. It's not just a swing, right? If you understand how the body moves, you can translate that into mathematics. Huge, huge amount of thing. Healthcare, medical, it's a massive field. Just remember to connect the dots. Uh, what kind of students get into Harvard? Lucky ones. I'll be honest. When I went there, there were people dumber than me who got in. And there are people who are so much smarter than me who didn't get in. It's luck. You have to reach a certain point. You have to be top of what you're trying to do. You have to be extremely passionate. You have to have a great essay, good marks, all of that, and then it's luck. But you know, if it's not Harvard, you, if you're a good candidate, if you apply to 20 of the top universities, you'll get into five. Those 15 are luck. I'll be very honest with you, it was luck. I want to understand if there's a conflict between psychology and political science. Absolutely not. What do you plan to do with a political science career is basically influence people. That's your psychology, right? Political science is essentially psychology taken to a larger realm of human interaction. Pretty much the same subject analyzed from two different ways. There is zero conflict. It's just about how do you stack them? Are you in a college that allows you to take both of them together? Uh, and uh, you know, how are you able to translate that into a career? Um, you can be a political polist, a political scientist, and a psychology degree is absolutely essentially required for that. You can't be that if you just have a political science major. That just tells you how to run political science. It doesn't tell you how human beings tick. If you want to become a doctor, but then you like maths, absolutely. Great doctors, great mathematics. Again, please, everybody, remember this. The best innovations in the world happen 
when somebody took one field and combined it with another. Easiest, easiest way to innovate. Take two fields which seemingly are very different, combine them, boom, innovation. Cheapest, fastest way to do innovation. I wish our governments knew that. I wish most of our, our universities knew that. I wish most of our companies knew that. So currently, COVID-19, all the statistical models, all the systems are all mathematical, all our research into what's happening, all of our clinical trials, stats, and I said, all mathematics. Math and medical go hand in hand today. Why? Because you need data. Medicine today is all about data and math really helps you calculate that data and get those algorithms to work for you. My apologies, Mr. Varia. We'll, yeah, we'll, I think I've been out of we'll time. Take a call. <laughs> I was trying to run through as many. Because I still have 120 questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. And uh, I think, I think uh, you know, if you permit, uh, we can share the questions with you and see if we can take up most of them, club it, and then uh, respond to the students individually. Is that something which, uh, can I commit to the group here? And we'll figure it out. Everybody has a lot of questions. So uh, we'll figure out a way to do this. Um, I'll work with you on something, Arun. <laughs> sure. I'm get done. Good. So, uh, you know, let's take the last two because I'm sure there are, there are parents, students, and teachers who are expecting. So the last two questions of your choice, and then uh, we'll figure out some other mechanism to respond to them. Sure. I'm just going to take some very standard ones. First, um, you know, I want to take up pharmacy, but I'm interested in A economics too. Very confused at this stage. Don't, again, I'm a, the reason why I want to answer this question is very, very simple. Uh, remember, all of our, the greatest, greatest, the most money, the most success is made when you take two professions and combine them. Today, economics and pharmaceuticals. If you have a degree in economics and in pharmacy, I will hire you. It is so difficult to find someone with those two degrees because if you want to launch a new medicine, if you want to understand what markets are working, you understand trade, supply chains, you need economic help, you need medicine. So as a general thing, please never think taking two opposite degrees are confusing. And this is something which I pray to parents they're not confusing. The best way is to take two opposite degrees and combine them. That's where the real easy money is, the real easy career success is because you are unique and what you bring to the table, nobody else can. Last question, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, recommendations for books. There are so many, but if you want to really, really do a book which uh, will transform the way you think, it's a difficult book, but read it, John Stuart Mill's on Liberty. On Liberty, John Stuart Mills, um, the fundamental basis of how societies work, everything we have today in terms of freedom, rights, and all can all be traced back to Mills. Uh, very few people in India read it. Almost every single person uh, in the world who's, who matters loves this book. John Stuart Mill, On Liberty, it's free. Go online. You can find online copies of it everywhere. Please read it. It's a fantastic book. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me, guys, and great questions. Love it. Wish I were here for another three hours and we could <laughs> get to every single one of them. <laughs>